Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. And thank you very much to Photo London for hosting this important conversation, uh, this chance to discuss the quite unique moment in which the Imperial War Museum is exhibiting a show about the current and ongoing war in Ukraine. I'm, I'm Max Horton. I run the MA in Photojournalism and Documentary Photography at London College of Communication, as well as a research hub, Visible Justice, that I run there with David Birkin. And I'm a writer and curator with the photographic image. And I'm delighted to welcome photographer Anastasia Taylor-Lind, who has been working in Ukraine since 2014, which is when she met Elisa Sopova, yeah. uh, a journalist and now anthropologist, but we'll come to that, um, in uh, eastern Ukraine. Sorry, Donbass or Donetsk? Uh, well, Donetsk is the city and Donbass is the broader region. Thank you. Sorry. OK, good, good knowledge. <laughs> and the, the two women um, here have been working together ever since. Um, the exhibition uh, Ukraine Pictures from the Frontline at the Imperial War Museum is a collaborative venture between uh, Anastasia and Elisa, each similarly concerned with um, issues of representation of people who are on the one hand living if they live with issues, um, sorry, uh, who are living if they do live through the most extreme human experience possible. And on the other, trying to, because they absolutely have to continue with the semblance of daily life. And it's these concerns as well as their perspectives, their shared understandings, their differences, their great friendship, their respective practices in image and text, which will form the basis of this discussion. And they will present for approximately 20 minutes um, momentarily. I'm also very glad to welcome to the discussion Greg Brockett, who is photography curator at the Imperial War Museum. Um, as part of the museum's remit to engage with contemporary conflict, um, primarily in relation to how it affects the UK, um, Greg was familiar with Anastasia's work in Ukraine and realised that this kind of, I'm going to call it intimate documentary, but that's my phrase, um, could offer a, a space for people to begin to comprehend this devastating conflict. And the show began to form while Anastasia was still photographing in, in Donbass, so that's this, this modus operandi is highly unusual for a museum um, who are more used to working with archival material and I know that Greg will these are the challenges uh, that Greg will speak about in the second present his second presentation which will last for approximately 10 minutes and um, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, after the presentations I'll ask a few pres uh, a few questions of the panel um, before opening out the discussion to you the audience who I assume are here hello <laughs> um, you'll notice there's a Q&A box that's the method um, for which we are able to take questions that's the only method so please if you have questions do write them in the chat and we'll get through as many of them as we can that's literally what the panelists are here for so please make the most of that um, and I will um, or we will read them out and and answer them accordingly um, before we finish at precisely 7pm um, or no later than 7pm um, very briefly um, biographically Anastasia Taylor Lind creates long form documentary work for National Geographic, Vanity Fair and The New Yorker, among others. She's a TED fellow and a Nyman fellow and is currently completing her second master's degree in writing poetry. Elisa is a journalist and uh, currently a doctoral candidate in anthropology at Princeton University. Uh, I can't wait to hear your conversation. So um, Anastasia and Elisa, um, I'll hand it straight over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Max. Um, and hello, everybody. It's a little strange being online and not being able to see your faces, but it's really, really nice to be here with you um, virtually this evening. Um, <clears throat> just bear with me a second while I start by screen sharing. Let's see where we are. <clears throat> So um, while the exhibition that Alyssa and I have at the Imperial War Museum at the moment um, covers uh, snapshots, if you like, of several projects that we've worked on over the years uh, from 2014, when the war started in Ukraine, right up until um, the Russian invasion uh, that started last year, um, the majority of the, the the documentary work that we've been uh, making collaboratively has been um, an ongoing long-term project that we've called 5K from the front line. Yeah, so so basically um, Anastasia and I, we come from, we kind of came together to this point from a different, very different background. So Anastasia has a global perspective of covering uh, multiple wars and I come from very local perspective. 
So basically, my point of entering it was that, um, as most of us do, until the war happened to me when I was 26 years old in 2014, I knew about war from movies, from books, from history, the way most of us knows about it. And uh, when it actually happened to me, I was surprised and perhaps even shocked by the discrepancy between what it, what the lived, lived experience of war was like and how different it was from everything I knew about it. And so eventually when we met with Anastasia, we, uh, we spoke a lot about that and we kind of came to realize that uh, media coverage and the broader visual representation of war in Ukraine and war in general uh, relies a lot on certain tropes of war photography, such as tanks, soldiers, explosions, ruined uh, cities, crying women, uh, uh, pitiable refugees, uh, which made the situation on the one hand immediately recognizable for the readers all over the world who, for the most part, don't have direct experience of it. But on the other hand, the, hand this practice produces a distorted picture that in, in excludes most of the actual non-sensationalist day-to-day experience of war. And so we uh, decided to try and experiment with doing something different mm -hmm. and showing a little bit more of what the actual life in war looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say it was wonderful to find my creative soulmate in Alyssa. Um, I had been thinking about these ideas of representation um, through my work over the last, well, now 20 years, um, thinking about this idea of what war might look like if it arrived in, in my own neighborhood. Um, and our initial, when we met first in 2014, we were discussing, or I was very curious about what Donbass, this Eastern region of Ukraine, um, that's been, um, well, for a long time was referred to as the forgotten war in Europe or a frozen conflict, what this place looked like before war arrived, essentially. <clears throat> yeah, and the part of the reason it was referred to as a forgotten conflict, because for a long time between 2000, let's say 15, 16 and 2022, last year when the big invasion started and Ukraine became a huge thing again, was that um, this being in that place didn't really provide kind of enough visuals that looked the way they were supposed to look for the audiences. So working for a while as a, as a fixer, as a local producer with, uh, for, with Western journalists and photojournalists, I was pretty frustrated by the fact that we were spending so much time and having this pressure from the editors, kind of trying to find uh, a place or a situation that looked enough like war while we were inside of the war zone and we were hearing those incredible stories and knowing that everyone who lives around, their uh, lives are profoundly impacted by war. But then we, were, we had to kind of dump it all and uh, you know, spend days and weeks trying to get access from the military to go to some checkpoint and photograph things that looked like war. And so we kind of started with assumption that the war zone does not have to look like a war zone. And let's, let's show it to people instead of kind of trying to come along with this convention that it has to look a certain way. So as you can see, uh, most of the pictures you, you are seeing here they don't look, you cannot tell that it's war. Like um, on the screen you are seeing right now, this is a, a family or a Greenick family. Um, the family was, we first met in 2018 when the first photo was taken. And the second uh, photo was taken in 2022, in mm -hmm. December 2022, December. when they became refugees. And on the first photo they live, uh, this is the time when they still lived in the uh, native town of Avdiivka. And um, this photo was taken literally like 50 meters away from the uh, nearest uh, Ukrainian military position. But by the photo, you could not really tell that. And we wouldn't be able to take a photo that would show the position. But these people living here, their lives were, were to a large degree shaped by that, uh, by that proximity. And um, so we were, we were finding this balance between uh, visuals and my short texts that we are explaining the context and explaining what actually what this family is actually living through. And on the picture on the right here, you can see it's just Olya and the two kids because Nikolai, um, the, the father, father, 
is uh, is now a member of the Ukrainian armed armed forces. So I think uh, there's a broader question here that interests me in that you well the first question is what does war look like and how can you bridge this um this discrepancy if you like between what it really looks like and what it looks like in photographs and i have a feeling that um uh, the idea that domestic scenes like the two that you see here um are uh, or domesticity in itself and women's work is undervalued in general outside of a war zone. It's considered not important. It's certainly not worthy of documentation of some, you know, of elevating some simple thing like um, Olia pouring out this sweet condensed milk for the kids um, to be representative of some huge uh, in invasion. Um, but actually these things take place every day across Ukraine, these small, um, and I would say for the most part, undocumented, um, undocumented acts that all, all play into the idea of what it's like to continue living in, inside a war zone. Oh yeah, this is actually the good slide uh, for what I was mm -hmm. going to say next, is that one of the things we eventually discovered, I mean, th there are things that you know in the back of your head, but you never really like come to, can conceptualize it. And something that we managed to conceptualize in the process is that people who, who appear on these photographs, they are uh, pretty aware of how they are expected by the audiences to look like, because they're not only uh, being portrayed, they are also consumers of the same, pretty much the same content as we consume in different ways, but they, they also see all these photo, war photos and they kind of, have to play along with what they, with, with the way they're expected to see. So something, for example, we discovered is that, as you can see here on the first and second photo, and all three photos actually. It's the taken, same family. It's the same family, family their extended family, um, uh, you know, having a, bar, having a picnic and uh, fishing and doing barbecue. And um, In we discovered, these yeah, and, the, and something that we, we noticed a lot is that people are, we were especially at that time uh, really reluctant to uh, being photographed at that moment because they would say that oh you're you're taking photos of us having fun and people will judge us for ha having fun during the war because they see these images and they they know that they're expected to exhibit suffering at all times and being miserable and they're not expected to be seen and actually enjoying themselves and um, I think Anastasia had a similar example uh, yeah, I, 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 this is something that that um, this is something that comes up again and again when we're on the ground reporting. Um, at the beginning of the Russian invasion last year, I was uh, making portraits in a makeshift studio on the Polish border of mostly, almost predominantly, women and children who are who are fleeing Ukraine. And there was one moment when I photographed a woman called Oksana and her daughter. And she stood in the portrait studio and I asked her to look at the camera. Um, and she said, she, it was a joke. She said, would you like me to look like a refugee for you now? And it's, it's a joke, but it's, it's also a painful joke because it, it reflects back to me um, the nature, the nature of uh, the work of photojournalists and also, and also the harm that we can do in terms of representation. Yeah, and it's not also not just like two way thing that, uh, okay, there is harm being done and then there are people being aware of that. But this situation, it creates like a spiral of misrepresentation where there is content that misrepresents what it looks like. And then people see it and they play, feel the pressure to play along with that. And so they keep kind of pretending to fit into the template that exists out there for no good reason. And then the next people see it again and it kind of reproduces itself again and again. So there are, there are also, um, I'm a photographer, Alyssa's a writer. Beyond that, Alyssa is also now an anthropologist and I am also a poet. So we have these other creative, um, or storytelling forms that play into the journalism that we report to together also. And um, it's been 
it's been super interesting for me to learn about anthropology through your studies and some of these you're articulating in an academic context the issues that come up for us while we're reporting for example the idea that civilians are not always passive and and dependent yeah there was sense uh... I think it's always useful to maybe be in more in than in one profession that kind of intersect in a way, because uh, as a journalist you just follow conventions and you follow what your editors expect you to do, and uh, it's kind of hard and the rhythm of work is such that it's hard to stop and reflect uh, thoroughly on what you are actually doing. While uh, now being in academia, half that's half of myself <laughs> um i actually got this opportunity and i got to 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 be exposed to certain scholarship that reflects on the things that i've been always noticing but just uh, thinking that this is how it is supposed to be something like going back to civilians who are passive independent there is a lot of scholarship on for example on uh, um yeah on the like practices of uh, othering that is what was called other in anthropology practice of other in in which we supposedly feel empathetic and we supposedly feel yeah we supposedly empathize with people who are suffering but they always portrayed a little bit differently from us and they always like this one of them is this cliche of uh, kind of veiled woman because so many wars uh, in recent years took place in middle east this kind of crying women in headscarves became became a trope and then many photographers who came to ukraine especially in the early stages were really fond of photographing like there is a like ukraine is not a muslim country but there are like in rural areas elderly women all often wear kinds scarves. of hair, scar yeah. head scarves and they were like really fond of photographing these babushkas and head scarves because they would fit that idea and that was always frustrated by the fact that like my experience was my not just my personal but experience of people like me people from like downtown Donetsk was often overlooked because we just looked like westerners you know in many ways mm -hmm. and so we we were somehow not deemed interesting because we were not exotic enough to be to look like victims of war in anthropology there is whole discussion now about how uh refugees and people in war zones and the so-called illegal migrants are portrayed and are becoming the new savages because we cannot talk about people uh, hunter gatherers in Africa as savages anymore luckily but we still have the slot of other and it's being filled up with this like new savages quote unquote mm -hmm. who are different from us mm -hmm. and uh, therefore yeah people who who don't look exotic enough their experiences are not uh, are overlooked yeah and of course this is a, an issue that we we deal with massively in in journalism and generally but particularly in fo the photographic representation of uh people in other places particularly people in other places who suffer or who who live with war and part of um you know one of the many complex reasons why this takes place is because typically we have uh, predominantly male, white, heterosexual, middle-aged outsiders from the world's richest countries telling the stories of the majority of the experiences of the majority of people in the world. And so that's something that, um, that we think about and talk about a lot. Um, this idea of the two of us uh, as a reporting team having the perspective of the outsider and the and the insider and that kind of plays out in the type of reporting we do but it also has different effects when we're actually out making interviews spending time with people and photographing them um, in the way that we can get access sometimes it can be very useful that i'm a foreign journalist from the uk um, and people uh, can can be very interested in me and my experiences um and sometimes uh equally um you know the the people the response of people whose stories we telling who whose stories we are telling to Alyssa 
when they learn that she's from Donetsk City and that she is part of their community also yeah brings equally you know access uh, I say access that's kind of a, a cold reporting term but I mean in terms of um arriving in a place and just rapport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, rapport building rapport yeah. but you know are often walking down the street and seeing who's sitting outside their houses and and approaching them and saying hi we're journalists can we talk yeah. to you for a minute yeah i think this is also something that uh, i always wanted to do but was not sure this is the right thing to do but that uh, anthropology helped me to actually uh, bring into the practice is um the idea that you don't have to hurry out, you don't have to rush, yeah. and you actually have to spend some time with the people you are reporting on to be able to just be able to more adequately represent there what is happening to them. But second, to also just be a decent human being and give back to them a little bit, um, something in exchange to them opening up their lives to you. Because um, something that I've seen a lot uh, in Ukraine in earlier years of, of, of the war and probably happening now a lot as well, is this kind of very extractive reporting when journalists arrive in a big fancy car for an hour into the community and just jump into somebody's house and uh, ask them questions. And then as people, and for many people in rural Ukraine, this might be like literally the first Americans they've ever met in their lives. And they just begin pulling out like, the most precious, you know, um, groceries they have in their house mm -hmm. and to put up a table to, you know, to offer the, all, all they have when the, um, journalists say, time to go by, you know, and turn, turn, you know, go into their fancy car and leave. And um, just the opportunity to do it differently, uh, this is something that I really value yeah. our work for. And I should say as well that, you know, um, uh, well, for example, the central the central picture on the screen now is of, of Sasha. Um, and uh, the picture on the right is of Lena, his wife, with her grand grandson, Nikita, who's in Poland. The central picture was made in, in Dnipro region um, last summer. Um, and we've been follow uh, we've been friends with Elena and Sasha um, since 2018 when we first met them and there were also occasions where we visited them just to have a barbecue and hang out and um, without making pictures or doing any interviews yeah. or anything anything like that over these these five years. Yeah so now when we are talking about it and showing pictures and saying like look we knew these people back in 2018 and here they are in this disastrous invasion being, refu being refugees it sounds very impressive, but the, the thing is that um, we did not, obviously we, we have no, we had no way of knowing what was coming and we didn't know whether it would ever come handy the way it came handy in the situation. And the reason we have this footage now is because we just bothered to spend enough time with these people and to return to them next year and to return and to the them next year. a year after. And not to just dump them the moment we got the quote we needed for that particular story five years ago. Mm. And and I should say as well that um, all of the the work that we're showing you has been almost almost entirely uh, self funded, um, certainly self initiated. These these pictures and the reporting that Alyssa made to accompany them didn't come. Um, for the most part from any assignments. This was um, just our choice to spend some time together in Donbass and to, yeah, to yeah. report. In fact, something that was happening that over all these years that the war in Ukraine was known as forgotten war um, uh, was that it was impossible to get an assignment to work in Ukraine. Yeah. And so we would just go and do our thing. And uh, then when we, because this um, 5K from the Frontline project is based uh, largely in social media, and once we were posting it on social media, then the editors would see it and would get the angle and the value of it. And almost every, actually every time yeah. we went there, we ended up being able to publish it, to, to put it together into a story and publish it in like world stop media. Yeah, so we, uh, and almost, and always we received those, um, those publications from sharing the work on Instagram. So different chapters, 
of this project have been published in first Time magazine, then um, the New York Times, then the New Humanitarian and the last two chapters in NPR with the first commission coming in December, December from NPR. Yeah. So I hope that gives you some um, insight into how, how the work's been made and, and why we made it and how we made it. Um, and I, we're gonna hand over to Greg now, um, who's gonna talk a little bit about how these pictures ended up in the Imperial War Museum. Um, and um, yeah, and started a, a, another life, if you like, outside of the news media and in a museum context. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, as, as Max said at the, at the start, um, the presentation. So I work it within a contemporary conflict team. And so we, we work and collect around conflicts. It's post 2001, essentially. Um, and I think for a lot of people that in itself comes as a surprise. I think we're often associated with um, our collections of the First World War and Second World War, and maybe a bit beyond that. But um, a lot of our collecting up until this point has been focused on conflicts which have had more direct involvement with the, the British military, I, I suppose. Um, and we're not, we're not a military museum, we're a museum of conflict, we tell stories of conflict, um, but what we tend to do is we, we, we run assessments of conflicts which are ongoing, um, and we sort of, we assess them based on their impact to the UK. So that could be direct military impacts, it could be uh, political uh, and economic, um, so I think I, so I think more typically um, we, we have a lot of coverage of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, and where we've collected around those conflicts, we've collected most often uh, photos taken by serving personnel on the ground in those places, um, but we're also a repository for official MOD photography as well. Um, when we looked at, when we looked at the conflict in Ukraine, we we, we decided the, the the kind of the social, the political, and the economic impact on the UK was such that it's something we should start looking at more, and we should reflect in our collections and in our interpretation as well. Um, so yeah, as as Anastasia mentioned, I, I was already aware of her of her work, and we'd we'd we met to discuss the the work that she'd done. Um, in Donbass region and and during the during the events at, at Maidan. Um, so I think when the invasion happened in 2022, it seemed to make sense for us to speak to Anastasia again and 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 see if she was interested in perhaps collaborating on something. Um, within the museum at the time, we, we obviously felt there was a there was a, a public interest in what was happening. But where I think Anastasia's work and Alyssa's work really um, helped to support what we wanted to do was the fact that it gave us, was able, it allowed us to show a little bit of that background prior to the 2022 invasion. Um, you know, it, it had gone under the radar for quite a while up to that point, I think. Um, so part of the exhibition is to initially introduce that, particularly the protests that happened in 2014, and then the, the, the ongoing conflict which happened in, in Donbass region after that. Um, so yeah, there was that, there was that obvious reason. And that there's also you know, the fact that Alyssa had been working with Anastasia for this amount of time, and they had made this project, which was much more about ordinary people's experience experiences of living amidst conflict in those areas. So that enabled us as well to show a perspective which I think was really different to what people were seeing in the news at that time. Um, it was different from a lot of the, 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 the drama um, that is often associated with, with, with conflict and, and conflict reporting and allowed us to show like a little bit more um, of what it was like for ordinary people. And I think one area we really managed to achieve that quite well was, was, was through some of the quotes we included as well. So a lot of the all the photos have either a quote from uh, Anastasia, from her perspective of what it's like taking those photos, or from Alyssa, 
or on some occasions, some of the people actually in the, the photos themselves. So we really felt that helped to sort of draw out an extra level um, of interpretation from the photos than people were ordinarily getting just from following the, the news coverage. Um, so yeah, we don't, we do do contemporary exhibitions. We, we, we've done one on, on conflicts such as Yemen in, in the past, for example. Um, but I think, yeah, what was most unusual in this, in this situation was the fact that, you know, we had a very short uh, lead, run in time. So, it, you know, we initiated the project and it was, under, it, was, it was running within a matter of months, essentially. And Anastasia was still making the work out in Ukraine whilst we were, whilst we were doing it. So that, that was, I suppose, the most unusual aspect of it for us. Um, I, think, I think in a way that kind of that urgency meant that we sort of like, we, we had to collaborate um, quickly. And I think it, we, had a, we sort of had a shared vision of the kind of images we wanted to include and the kind of themes we wanted to pull out, which I think helps us to decide you know, to pick images, um, which I assume is well, many, many hundreds that uh, have been taken over over the past so several years working in that in that area, yeah, enable us to sort of like I think streamline the process a little bit more, and yeah, whittle it down to sort of seventeen images in quite a short space of time. Um, so it, it, on occasions, you know, it would have been. The most recent images, for example, I think in kind of like June 2022, and the exhibition sort of launched in Man IWM Manchester initially. Um, at that time, we were looking at contact sheets as they were coming back um, and making this decision based on that as to what we were sort of going to press ahead with and interpret and include in, in, the, in the overall narrative itself. Um, yeah, you can see that these are the shots here. This is actually of the London display, which is a, a much sort of smaller space than, um, than when it initially opened in Manchester. So that in itself was, uh, was a challenge for the designers and the exhibition team to fit in the same images, essentially, but in a much smaller space. And I think it actually sort of creates a sort of more intimate environment, actually, with those photos. Um, and I noticed myself having been in both, that you know, there's was, was a lot more um, quiet reflection and I think that smaller space, which I think really works well with the, with, with the work we, we had on display. Um, I think, but also in the exhibition itself, I think the, the decision to, to not frame things um, as they are made them feel a lot more present to me. Uh, I think there's something about in a gallery where you have things are framed, it, it almost creates a sort of level of separation. And I think they were had a much more sort of presence in the way that we decided to display them in the end. So. Yeah, we were obviously extremely pleased with the outcome and you know, the visitor feedback and the visitor figures um, have been really excellent. So yeah, it, for us and for me, it's the start of a, of a process where we want to collect more around, around the Ukraine. And so this is, like, this is the very early stages of that, of that development, but you know, that, that'll probably include photos, but hopefully other items as well. Um, Things like oral histories, which is something we've collected quite a lot around um, in Afghanistan and Iraq from veterans that have been involved in those conflicts. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully a really, a really good start for us. Um, but yeah, more, more, more to come. We hope certainly in terms of being able to make the collections accessible to to people further down the line as well. But it, it tends to be a, a sort of longer process. Um, in regards to collecting when it comes to when it comes to collecting around conflicts, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I mean, I did you uh, did you have any specific questions, Maxi, or things you wanted me to cover? Yeah, thank well, thank you um, for just explaining how it kind of came into being. And obviously, it was a I mean, you have it's not the absolute first time, but um, yeah, working in a, a very different way. Um, to the archival practices um, of, of museums um, and just that, yeah, the, the speed of that, I mean, um, and, and just in, you said 17 images, I did mean to count them, 
um, myself. And you said that you seem to have a shared vision. I know I noticed the credit said that it's a kind of um, collaborative curation um, between you. But were there? I know that the museum has a remit to not be political. Um, I wondered if there were any disagreements um, in terms of images that would be in or out because. And knowing um, something, certainly, of Anastasia's photographic practice, an image, for example, of, um, like the one from Butcher um, of the exclamation of, of the mass grave is very different to, I mean, obviously, it's Anastasia's image, um, but it's, it's a very different register to her usual practice. And I'm just interested in the conversations that you had around that, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Actually, these pictures are selected from, I mean, probably I shared several hundred pictures with Greg, but these pictures are selected from tens of thousands, probably more than a hundred thousand pictures that I've made um, over the years since, since 2014. And so um, some of the work is made on medium format film, which is my preferred way of working when I'm I'm making my own projects, like the the portrait series from Maidan, which became a, a book that was published the same year in 2014, um, and the 5K from the Frontline Project. And then um, since the Russian invasion, or when the Russian invasion happened, I was working um, almost entirely on assignment for the first few months. And so those pictures from Butcher, for example, were made while I was on assignment for the Guardian newspaper. Actually, I hadn't, um, I hadn't really worked for a newspaper before. I hadn't expected to find myself making news pictures in Ukraine. And so um, as a result, I mean, the images that any photographer creates are different considering the, the context or the, the reason those pictures are being made. So, so those photographs had to be very, um, uh, had to be um, very explicit in showing what was happening. And also I had to make them and file them to the newspaper the same day in order for them to be published, usually the day, the day after or sometimes that day. So um, yeah, the, the exhibition in general spans a very broad sort of working practice as a photographer there's a you know a few images from from the Maidan series which which was a book of a hundred portraits made in this sort of very formal although makeshift portrait studio which is a different visual register to the reportage work the slow long form reportage work we've been making together and then the 35 millimeter digital um, pictures that I was making while on a, on assignment yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point because, you know, I think to a lot of our audiences, um, understanding different types of conflict photography is something which perhaps um, a lot of people don't know too much about. I think they probably are more familiar with the sort of reportage style, but the sort of the, the longer form project, which was included as part of the exhibition as well, is, is perhaps something that people don't more traditionally uh, associate with that. So I think, you know, it was good for us to be able to introduce that kind of work. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I would like to collect more of. And I think it's, you know, we have we have the Tim Hethington archive now at IWM um, and we set up a network of photo journalists off the back of um, off the back of that, which, which Anastasia was a part of. And what I'm hoping to do is collect more um, photo journalism, but other types of um, conflict photography as well and sort of like try and introduce that to our audiences a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I think it was interesting as well to see um, if people would make that distinction when they were actually in the exhibition itself, because you obviously have a different, a, a kind of a different style, uh, two different styles within one sort of small gallery area. So, you know, it's not something we, we necessarily go into too much in the, in the interpretation itself, but it's certainly something which, um, I was interested in whether like, people would pick up on or whether it was something that um, people would uh, want to explore more in terms of there being a, a longer form of this kind of work and, and photojournalism journalism and, where, and where those two things differ. And Greg, you're reminding me as you're talking as well. I mean, now this talk is um, organized by Photo London. And so we're talking very much about the photography and the process of photography. But the people who come to the Imperial War Museum um, are, could we say even like the general public, I mean, and of all ages, 
we've spent time in, in the exhibition space. Uh, we, we were there yesterday with a group of, of school children um, talking about how, how we work together. So, you know, you have kids. In fact, you mentioned the butcher picture, um, Max, and there was, there was one day I was in the exhibition and a mom with two kids that would have been 10 or 11, German, German speaking, uh, walked past and one of the kids asked their mom, mom, are those people dead? And she said, yes. And she explained, she explained the caption. And so that was really, you know, as kids don't read the New York Times, you know, it was like a real, it's been a really amazing way for our reporting and our work to reach people that I think we, we haven't had the chance to reach before, right? Yeah, we're just talking like we, we met yesterday another attendee at the, at the exhibition who said that we started to, who said he was very interested and they started saying to him this is based on a project that is on Instagram and he said I'm not on social media and of course many people are not on social media and if somebody is not on social media and not reading New York Times um, they would not be exposed yeah, how to we, this. How do we reach them? Yeah. I think the, the Butcher images, yeah, is a good example as well of how we had to um, almost sort of future-proof the interpretation of the exhibition as well. We had to obviously think about how the situation was going to be changing and evolving um, as the exhibition was open. And so, you know, we, we, you know, we, we couldn't really preempt too much of what was going to happen, but I think there's some key photos we did include, which, you know, took on more relevance as time went on, uh, Butcher being one of them, and there's obviously now more sort of war crimes under investigation um, which have happened in the time since the since the exhibition has been opened, so it's kind of like it's it's sort of gained more relevance in that sense. And I think similarly, the lady um, who's uh, having the, the delivery of coal, you know, this was sort of like you know this was in the summer um, with the winter oncoming, and so that issue in itself became so much more relevant. Um, and you know, the way in which uh, energy had became weaponized, uh, particularly in that uh, over the last winter period. Um, made that again made that photo seem um even even more um, substantial in, in the way in the kind of you know what he was communicating i think so yeah there was an element of having to sort of like i guess sort of not preempt but sort of like you think about how things were going to change and evolve mm, thank you and again in relation to that particular image because you know to it, it could be used as evidence perhaps of a war crime and I'm particularly interested um Elisa in in terms of so you've obviously been um a big part of many of the images and are involved in the conversations with the people um in that image I assume you weren't there um the butcher image and I wonder if there's anything in seeing a photograph of um a potential crime against humanity in your country taken by your very close friend of people you know very close um geographically um to to people you grew up with if the mediation of a museum exhibition has any kind of sort of well, obviously it has an impact on you I guess I'd just like to know what that is and if it's different from the images that you are kind of long-term committed to as opposed to the other kinds of, of representation well I would say that um I think I would maybe repeat myself on certain level, but uh, um, this is one of the examples, in a way, of um, of not misrepresentation, but maybe selective representation of what's going on in war zone, because everybody knows about Bucha, and uh, um, other there are like tons of war crimes going on in Ukraine since 2014, and most of them just didn't get so much publicity. So when I see this. Um, image, I think, yes, of course it is important. This is another image from Bucha. Uh, the thing is that um, we started this project when actually we were being on assignment for uh, International Bar Association, is that the right yeah. name? International Bar Association that hired Anastasia to uh, test their app for documenting human rights right violations in war zone. And so we were going around and documenting little things like traces of shelling on civilian build, apartment buildings and schools, as uh, kindergartens taken as military, used being used as military bases, and so on and forth, so forth. And this, um, this is not, again, this is not as spectacular perhaps as Bucha, but uh, the things are so ubiquitous in Ukraine that people often don't pay attention anymore to things that are evidence of, of war crimes, not necessarily crimes against humanity perhaps, but war crimes. 
and um yeah and so when i see this this photograph like what it makes me think about is how we can document war crimes that are not so famous necessarily and what are the ways of portraying things that are not as spectacular as uh, um, you know bags uh, body bags uh, being laying around yeah, no, thank you. Um, I wanted to say, and um, please, I just want to encourage um, the uh, audience to write questions in the Q&A, because at the present I can't see any, and I'm pretty sure that you have some, but I certainly have um, more questions for now. And one of them being, so I was interested um, in the way that you spoke, um, Anastasia and Lisa, about being inside, outside, and the value of those, those different positions. But I just wanted to slightly take you back to, um, in, in a strange and very geographically distant way but a kind of shared experience of on the one hand a post-Soviet childhood and on the other hand a, a somewhat unusual childhood in rural um, England Cornwall without electricity and how that has enabled you to kind of meet as as humans who are interested in kind of storytelling sort of taking you back to to those beginnings and indeed indeed your friendship and the, the value of that in the face of such um yeah, of, of, of horrible war. Well, I think I think we had pretty different upbringings, you know, <laughs> in terms of experience. Um, but we have, but underneath all of our experiences, we do generally have a common outlook on the world or some shared kind of, um, you know, person, pers on a personal level, some sort of, shared reaction reaction to things i know that sounds very general <laughs> but um uh, what to say what to say I, I about think, that i think yeah i i think actually the way we connected with anastasia is example not of how we can dig out and find something common in our background but it's example of how people actually can connect so well across so many differences because it's really hard to find anything in common in the ways we both grew up and the ways our careers, except that we both we were, were in journalism. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. And yet we, we have such similar, we have old outlooks and, and such similar reactions. Yeah, and thing. we didn't know that when that was the case when we met. I think, I think this is in a way, maybe it proves that uh, what we are trying to do is right because we arrived to the same as I, uh, the sums I started with, we arrived to the same point from very different experiences, yeah. but we kind of came to the same conclusions uh, from seeing uh, similar things. Yeah, and, and my, and you know, when I, I didn't intend, I mean, actually I, I arrived in Ukraine in 2014 to work on a completely unrelated project, actually about population decline. And I was on my way to Donetsk city um, to, to make some reporting there as part of a much broader broader project so I was in Ukraine almost by chance when and decide and changed my plans and and decided to to follow um what was what was happening what was happening there um but for me in any case as as the outsider as the foreigner um as the visitor you know uh, my friendship with Alyssa are working our working relationship and also our friendship is, you know, one of the um, structural, the strong kind of like the, the thread that ties working in Ukraine in Ukraine together. You know, there were some summers where we, ju we just said, shall we just go to Donbass and do some reporting because it, we enjoyed doing it, right? Yeah, because it has become just kind of something we do every summer yeah <laughs> yeah and i wanted to add that it started from from kind of uh, certain uh, power you know power inequality in our positions because anastasia even though anastasia was a freelancer and not with some fancy media on assignment when we met but um, anastasia came as a kind of fancy foreigner from my perspective from the first world you know to cover the war and I, like just few times we met, I was Anastasia's fixer and translator. I was kind of hired as a local, you know, local translator. And then eventually, like I was thinking recently how we kind of ended up where we are. It wasn't like one moment when I was 
decided that, oh, now I want to empower myself and, you know, get to the equal point with Anastasia. Or it was Anastasia decision, like, I'm going to empower local actor, you know, Alisa. And uh, like, there is this whole discussion, we should give a byline to a fixer and so on. But there were, I'm sure, like, Anastasia was moved partly by this, uh, at some level by this, but it wasn't some conscious decision of let's make it this way. But somehow, even like, also, this is like another difference to add to the points we came from. And somehow we ended up as collaborators who kind of contribute equally and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and do things together without us yeah. making a, a conscientious effort to do so. And, and, and talking about privilege, I mean, absolutely. I was working in Ukraine because I have passport privilege and I can go there. We're talking to you now from my apartment in Hackney this is the first time we've been friends for nine years this is the first time that Alyssa has visited my apartment I've been to stay with you in Donetsk I visited in, you in Ukraine Alyssa lives in the US now I stayed with you many times in Boston right but this is the first time that Alyssa has I've been able to host her because because Greg wrote me a letter that I am a part of this exhibition and so she got the visa <laughs> Yeah. That's so nice. And um, I have a question that I, I think relates to the conversation that you guys have just had. But I just want to briefly ask Greg and Gina, thank you very much for your question and come right on to it. But if the the, the third voice, um, so the museum voice, the photographer voice, um, Alyssa's voice, if you could just say um, briefly, please, what, what difference that made and if that were more of a challenge for you or if it were just a sort of total benefit or, or how, how was that? Yeah, well, I think it's important, for, you know, for us to, um, you know, not not be exploitative of the situation. I think, you know, we wanted to 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 include a, a Ukrainian voice in that, um, um, and instead of just sort of, um, you know, perhaps we could have gone down another route of, of just showing showing, you know, some of the some of the photos which had like, you know, been most impactful, I suppose, in the news or whatever. So I think, yeah, having that kind of that angle was really important. Um, yeah, I suppose you know from the museum perspective, you know we 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 have a neutral voice in these situations. So you know our approach was really to um, to provide context to Anastasia and Alyssa's work, um, as we do with all the conflicts in in the museum. And I think maintaining that is something which allows us to have a, an authoritative voice in that sense and allows us to tell. Uh, about talk about conflicts from all different perspectives and, and angles. Um, it, it's a little bit different. It's working in really contemporary work. You know, if, if you're doing a sort of second model exhibition, for example, there's been a lot of historic research and there's been revisionism that happened as well. So in this context, we what we tend to do is work more with academic advisors, um, as we did as we did in this occasion uh, with uh, Professor Tracy German, uh, based at King's College. Um, and that's really the best way for us to, yeah, to, to allow us to work with people like Anastasia because it sort of, it gives a sort of context and it gives some background, um, but it, it, it means we have the museum voice as represented, which is, the, which is a neutral one. Um, but, it, you know, we're also giving, giving a platform for, 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 for work like Anastasia, which, which is more, um, which you know, incorporates more variety and different, different voices and perspectives as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. So um, we have a question from Gina Power. Um, it must be quite emotionally challenging to work on such a project. How do you both manage to keep grounded in order to keep the focus on producing your work? Thank you very much for your question, Gina. Shall I start by answering? And then, do, and then do, you, would you like to? Yeah. Yes, and then yes, you yes. say mm -hmm. from your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is a really, a really important question. Um, staying grounded um so i should say it's for me in any case it's it's a matter of perspective also you see i live here in hackney and um while i'm making work in ukraine my family is safe my apartment isn't in danger of being uh hit by a missile or shelled um i don't have to manage those aspects of my personal life at at war i i am able to be in ukraine and and focus solely on my work and um you know although i've been working in the country for this is the ninth year now i'm i'm not there all of the time so i'm going for a month or two months maybe and then i'm coming back um and i'm 
doing exactly that, becoming grounded creatively and in terms of my nervous system um, and emotionally, as you asked, Gina. And then I'm um, going back to Ukraine and making more work. So, so this is a really different um, way to approach work than um, for Alyssa and also all of our Ukrainian colleagues who, um, who are living during wartime as well as making, making work during wartime. Yeah, so I, I myself currently don't live in Ukraine either, but I lived quite a long time in both Donetsk and Kyiv during the first phase of the war. And my whole family still lives in Donetsk. And I would say, and so I, I mean, people I write about, their experience are pretty close to mine in many ways. And I would say that for me, actually, this work itself is therapeutic to a large degree, because, um, um, I mean, without give, giving diagnosis, but speaking of trauma in very general ways, like the, the best way, the most correct way of dealing with trauma is actually to narrativize it. So I think partly through narrativizing other people's experiences and mine a little bit too, I'm also narrativizing what I've lived through and what I feel about that. Um, there are different responses to this experience of war I observed people having. And I think the, the one I'm having is one of them, which is the urge to, instead of shutting it down and, uh, and be going into denial, which more many people do, is kind of dig into that and try to understand what's happening to my community, what's happening to me, what's happening here. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I think it helps me. And as Anastasia mentioned, her, her family, I think what helps me to be grounded specifically is actually talking to my mother who lives in Donetsk and is getting shelled every other day these days. But she has this very commonsensical humanistic perspective to what's happening. And she just describes me like every day, what, 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 no, just normal everyday things she lives through and she and her friends and our family lives through. And this just help, reminds me uh, every time I feel I like get carried away by like too much emotional content or too much of like political, toxic political discourse that surrounds war. I kind of remind myself of my mom who still lives there and who just has this very commonsensical perspective to it. And, um, and I remind myself that if my family and these people I know there in Donetsk, they experience it this way and we don't, we don't hear much about it, then it's kind of my duty to try to remain true to their experience and communicate it. Thank you so much both for answering that. And that makes me want to ask, Greg, I mean, you were saying that the, the ability to put on contemporary exhibitions and work with people like Anastasia and, and Alyssa is, is um, I slightly misheard at that moment, but I think it's to do with the Tim Hetherington network. Is that, did, is that what you said? Just can I be clear about that? Um, yeah, I mean, that was more um, in terms of how I first connected with yeah. Anastasia. Um, so just yeah. so in, in relation to that, so Tim Hetherington was um, also a conflict photographer, not that he loved that term. Um, and he died in 2011 in Libya, as many perhaps um, of the audience will know. And in, in relation to that and in relation to the question and how um, both women have, have spoken about um, what, what they witnessed this evening, I, I wonder if you feel that the institution has any responsibility to, towards contemporary photographers covering conflict? I mean, I, I think our responsibility is, is really, you know, for the bigger picture perspective of, you know, continuing our work really to educate people about, about conflict. Um, you know that is that is for me our main remit i suppose sort of what what it, what um, motivates me i suppose um i think there's a, a great sense of purpose there i mean you know the, the museum was set up um following the first world war which was you know a war so devastating that you know many people thought this was going to be the war to end all wars um so they collected around that with the, with the belief that nothing like this was going to happen again and of course, they were, you know, very unfortunately wrong. Um, so the museum carried on collecting into the Second World War and has continued to collect and is continuing to now. And I think that's uh, a reflection of the fact that obviously war has continued. And it seems to, it seems to me, you know, hopefully not not inevitable, but it does it does seem to be the case sometimes. So, you know, I think it's important that you know we we raise awareness 
you know, in the UK as much as we possibly can. And, you know, I think, you know, for example, the, the school group that came around uh, to, see the, to see the exhibition, hopefully they they understand more about conflict from that from that experience and they extend, understand more about the, the risks that people take in order for us to be aware of what's happening. And uh, Tim Hetherington was was the same. And they, there are, of course, like a lot of a lot of um, good good work going going on out there. So places like the Rory Peck Trust, who are uh, sort of trying to help um, journalists and photographers in the field as much as they can. Um, but yeah, I think I think from the museum perspective, it's, it's you know it's 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 got to be about a bigger picture and you know helping hopefully people to understand you know more about conflict and hopefully that has a kind of a positive effect in some sense. Thank you. Um, are there any other, oh, uh, no, I don't think there is another question in the chat. Um, I th think I, I'm under the impression that we have to end punctually. Does anyone know otherwise? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't know if um, Solange might tell us if we ought to cease the conversation or if we should continue, if we can continue. Um, Punctual seem to have been the instructions. I thought I thought that it was. Oh no! Um, no, we have a note here saying you can continue if you want to. But I do notice that some people have perhaps left already. Um, so I don't know. It's up to you, Max. Okay. No, I just um, I was uh, uh, just aware of, of the you know the, the self funded nature of, of the project and just thinking of of you know I um, I think you have maybe got a grant recently. Is that right, Anastasia? Yes, yes, Alyssa and, and I just, talk about this. Yes, Alyssa and I um, just received uh, funding from the National Geographic Society to continue our collaborative reporting in Donbass for the next year. So, um, yeah, I, I, I estimate over the years I have probably applied for 60 or 70 grants or fellowships or um, you know, competitions to support the continuation of work and um and we got one, but we only needed one. So yeah, that's that's and we only thing. got it after it became a big hype. Yeah, we yeah. we received this grant after the full uh, I'm I'm actually really pleased I asked that question. I know that some um current and indeed past students of mine are in the audience and, and to know that you from a, a different perspective but have an exhibition in the Imperial War Museum had to do that to get one response that that's extraordinary um and well I'm really pleased that you have got it and that it will enable um future reporting like this and that yeah there's such value in the in, I'm going to go back to that word that I used at the beginning but the intimacy of this reporting and the room um it is a small room compared to the size of the Imperial War Museum but for me personally um and unexpectedly it was as I said to you um all already but this really lovely um lovely is that the right word but it, it, it was there was something lovely in the collective experience of just standing there very quietly and there, there were I don't know eight people in the room very very quiet and just sharing this experience which is otherwise you know on your phone or wherever you see news images and that yeah that meant something um so yeah I, I think it's Really, I do think it's excellent that the Imperial War Museum is engaging with contemporary conflict with contemporary photographers and, and journalists. Um, I just, yeah, I just hope that in terms of um, safety uh, and yeah, emotional and financial security that everyone who is has any sense of um, kind of responsibility and accountability can continue to improve those relationships. But that's just my particular take on that um but yeah is that uh, other than encouraging people to go and see the exhibition how much longer is it on for till monday mm. till monday i wasn't expecting that answer <laughs> <laughs> yes okay yes. so that's yeah three months already yes um, indeed. so Alyssa came for the for the last the last week that it's open that's why she's here the finissage as i learned the term <laughs> Um, amazing. Um, is there anything else you'd like to um, just transmit to the audience before we sign off? Well, I, I do. I perhaps wanted to add to this self-finding um, uh, theme that if there are, I know that uh, there are probably many photographers watching this um, or people closely interested in that. 
And if, um, if any of you are struggling with like similar problems, um, I, I just want to call to all of you to not be afraid to self-fund something that you mm -hmm. think is important to do. Because so many excellent projects I know came from self-funded mm -hmm. attempts because not always editors are able to see uh, you know, the amazing things that you're trying to do. And um, many countries like you, like right now, it's very expensive to report on Ukraine, but before the big invasion, Ukraine is actually a very cheap country and you don't need so much money to come and report there unless you want to have some fancy experience. You, you rent an Airbnb, you go around by taxi, you go on feet, you just talk to people. Mm -hmm. And many countries that are many places that are overlooked and that are not that are away from the big media interest are actually not so expensive to be at in. Mm. Yeah, right. I and and I suppose just I I, I mean what I've learned from this anyway is just how important it is to follow um, reporting that you're personally interested in because otherwise how could how could we sustain nine years? of reporting on related topics in the same place unless we were deeply interested and curious. Yeah, yeah. even though yeah. it was not always so like bright and smooth, we had some moments when we were not sure whether we should continue, whether there is anything else left to tell, whether we're just like returning over and over to the same place and it kind of looks the same every year. When, yeah, they were all good. Like sometimes it was just like very cold or very hot. <laughs> <laughs> or, Minus 20. or nothing works. No, there are just this dark periods when nothing works out and everything falls through. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we went through all of that and probably we will get more of it. <laughs> yeah, we should remember <laughs> but, that too. Yeah, but it's uh, like in the grand scale, it's, uh, it's all worth it. And just a last point then in relation to that, um, was there any point in photographing the same thing, you know, etc. Is there a sense in which you're photographing and indeed exhibiting for the future, for the future record for your children, Alyssa? Wait, can, can you repeat that again? I just, if you're photographing on writing, etc., making the work in the present, but is there a sense in which when you keep doing it and keep doing it, that you're also doing it for the future? Or is that just really obvious? I just wondered to what extent that you you kind of consider that temporality. Doing it for the future in terms of... The record, the literally the documentary record. Greg was talking about oral histories. Yeah, so, so <laughs> yeah, the reason maybe Greg mentioned it today too was that uh, Greg actually recorded oral history with me today. Oh, wow. Oh, and, wow. Was, and I had to sign a form that says something like, do you want to withdraw it from public use like till the end of your life or something like that? And that for the first time made me think like, oh, actually there is something that might like live longer than myself you know? and somebody might like listen to it hundred years from now or something. Um, and such moments make you think about it because normally like still I was trained mostly as a journalist and I've been journalist for the most of my life. And you are very used to this idea that it's so short lived. You produce something today, it's out tomorrow. Yeah. And the day after tomorrow, nobody remembers it anymore. And um, yeah. But also this question makes me think of um, not the future, but how we view our past work now. For example, a lot of our work was made around the town or the suburb of Donetsk called Avdivka, which is now under exceptionally heavy um, attack. attack every, daily, every day, or every day, all night, all day. Um, and uh, it was Alyssa who pointed out when, uh, you know, I was talking to Alyssa about editing, putting together slideshows to talk about our ongoing work now. And I noticed that there are some pictures I didn't include before. For example, a picture of Lena and her neighbors cheersing to glasses of homemade wine. It's paired, I don't know if you remember it, with um, a young couple having their wedding photographs taken at the artificial beach outside of Avdivka. And since the Russian invasion, I had a strong urge to always include those pictures in the edits, although I hadn't really thought about them very much before. And it was you who pointed out that the, the meaning of those pictures has changed us because we know that those things are, yeah, are, yeah. are gone now. Yeah, even in, short, in such a short span of time as nine years, back then it seemed like utterly unimportant even for ourselves. 
Uh, and then now when suddenly the whole town is basically being raised to the ground and there is no access to there, every photo from Abdiyevka seems uh, very important. And and the Grinick's house was destroyed in December. Um, Lena and Radion, their house has been completely destroyed now. Yeah. Like literally the, you know, some of the places um, and some of the people in my photographs don't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, the, the point of historic record is, is a really important one as well. And you know, I I I've spent I spend quite a lot of time um, trying to convince uh, photographers that are currently still working of the importance of of archiving their work for the for the long term. I think you know, there's a sort of perception with digital sometimes, which is obviously the format a lot of people work in now that they're going to be around and, and there will be uh, a safer format forever. But yeah, actually, sort of our experiences, um, actually, digital really isn't necessarily archivally safe and so what part of what I'm trying to do is 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 trying to um, talk to photojournalists who are working in you know areas which are of, of important to our remit um, to to talk to us about about archiving their work um, we're one of the few institutions who are very well set up to do it particularly with digital um, digital photos are you know surprisingly vulnerable um, they degrade over time hard drives burn out, you know, um, clouds close down. So it's 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 a really important point. And um, yeah, whilst we're thinking about, you know, what's what's happening, you know, more contemporarily, it's it's important that, you know, we well, I'm trying to persuade people to think more about, you know, how, how what that means for the sort of future generations as well and how they access this work and and to make sure it's not lost. Indeed. And on that note, I'll say thank you so much, uh, Anastasia, Lisa, Greg, Imperial War Museum, Photo London, and absolutely especially to the audience for listening this evening and do go and see the show. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.